commission meeting of November 9th to order, uh, start time 7 p.m. First on our agenda, well, I'm sorry, before we move to the agenda, I'll move to Beth Cavagna. Yes, I just wanted to clarify a couple of items that may have come up in conversations. One is um, anyone that is here this evening in regards to 12 Old Hollyville Road or 6 Cindy, 6 Cindy Lane, those are 830G applications before the Planning and Zoning Commission. They are scheduled for a public hearing on December 14th. The Planning and Zoning Commission at this time cannot listen to any testimony in regards to those two items. Okay, anything else, Beth? Um, in regards to 97 Stony Hill Road, um, I have developed an email list and request that if people want any information regarding that to contact the office. And that will not be on your agenda or discussed in the near future. I believe um, from, what the from what the property owner or potential property owner said is that they will be back in January to have further discussions with the Planning and Zoning Commission. Okay, good. All right, uh, moving on. First on our agenda is a public hearing. Uh, Louisa, I'm going to need you to pronounce your last name. You're oh, muted. Okay. My last name is Yupangi. Yupangi, thank you so much. Unit five and six, recreational soccer, seven Francis Clark Circle. Uh, Kitty, okay. if you'd read the legal notice. To appear in the Danbury News Times, November 1st and November 5th, 2021, legal notice. The Bethel Planning and Zoning Commission will hold a public hearing on November 9th, 2021 at 7 p.m. using the Zoom platform to hear the following. Louisa Yapang Yapangi, 7, 7 Francis Clark Circle, recreational use slash special permit. Text amendment section 71C3, non-conforming parcel. These applications can be found on the town of Bethel website under announcements or contact the land use office at 203-794 8578. Pat Rich Chairman. Thank you. Um, that's speaking to this application. Um, I'm going to do just a little bit of an intro on behalf of the applicant. And if you have any questions, um, you can speak to them directly. But if you noticed in the drive and review, anytime you're doing any kind of athletic activity uh, indoors in the industrial park zone, it requires a special permit, which requires the public hearing in front of you as the commission. Um, the property is owned by E.W. Batiste. Ed Batiste is the owner. The property is located across from Bethel Power. As you go into the park on the right-hand side, where the former little cafe used to be in that building. That building also houses a um, volleyball league or volleyball training, thing, something of that nature. Um, also, in regards to that, um, Luisa did submit a letter explaining how many people are there, what the numbers are pertaining to the leagues when they occur and things of that nature. Also included was a site plan showing the buildings as they are today. Um, there are some minor renovations that will have to be made within the building, dealing with ADA um, bathrooms and things of that nature. But um, it, the application itself was pretty self-explanatory and I did ask them here this evening to answer any questions that you might have in regards to the business. Okay, thank you. All right, as this is a public hearing, we'll reach out to the public first. Uh, David, if you would be kind enough just to let the public- or the know. applicant, Pat. Let the oh, applicant speak too, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, Louisa, did you want to speak to this? You're, Louisa, you're on mute. Uh, um, no, I just wanted to say hi to everybody, and my name is Luisa Yupangi, and, uh, you know, I wanted to, to enjoy in Bethel. I want to rent the property, uh, but it's all your, your decisions. Thank you. All right. Uh, again, as this is a public hearing, we'll move out to the public. Uh, David, if you'd be kind enough just to direct people on raising their hand to ask their question. Sure. Uh, for anyone who has any comment they wish to offer for this application, uh, they would use the raise hand ability in Zoom. You can uh, raise your hand by clicking on the reactions icon in the toolbar at the bottom of the Zoom app. 
uh, if that, uh, if you are unable to do that, you can also find your name in the participants list and raise your hand that way. And we'll await anyone who has public comment, although I'm not seeing anyone at the moment, Pat. Okay. All right, thank you. Then we'll move to commission members. Uh, I have no questions. Kitty? Uh, this was uh, used as, a, as a, some sort of sporting facility before this, and I can't see any problem with this application at all. Thank you. Penny? Uh, no, no questions. Uh, Penny? Was that Penny? No question. Thank you. <laughs> no questions. Kenny? Same, no questions. Thank you. Uh, John? John? I'm muted. <clears throat> You're muted, John. John. I got it. So, sorry, I had to press the mouse, guys. I'm sorry. I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Rob Stoll. I'm good. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to this. Rob Wallace. Yep, no questions at all. All right. Uh, Beth, is there any reason that we can't close this this evening? No, you can close it. Correct. All right. If I have a consensus from commission members, well, do we agree to close this this evening by a show of hands? If everybody can be seen. Rob, I assume your hand is up. My hands are up. Thank you. All right, this uh, application is closed. Moving on to Corbier, estate of John B. Shepherd, text amendment, non-conforming parcels, section 7.1.C.3, six peck lane. Uh, and Beth, who's speaking to this application? Attorney Peter Olson. Okay. Hi, Peter. Hello. Good evening. Do I have permission to share my screen? Yes. Um, you do, Attorney I, Olson. Excuse me. I think someone needs to read the legal. The legal oh, was, it was already read. It was already read. There were two oh. on the first legal notice. You read them both. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. Good evening. My name is Peter Olson. I'm an attorney with an office here in Bethel at 275 Greenwood Avenue. My firm name is Land Use and Conservation Council. I'm here tonight on behalf of Mary Ellen Corbier, who is the executrix of the estate of John B. Shepard. And I think I saw her on the video earlier um, in, in my gallery. So she's here tonight in, in case there are any questions. Um, the estate of John B. Shepard is the owner of a parcel of land in Bethel containing about 9.7 acres uh, in total, spread among four lots. Um, the property is known as Six Peck Lane and is located off of Chestnut Ridge Road. I put the GIS up on my screen um, where my cursor is, the arrow. This is the intersection of Greenwood Avenue and Chestnut Street. And if you follow Chestnut Street, it turns into Chestnut Ridge Road. And then you'll get to Gretchen Lane, approximately here, where the frog is, if you know the frog. And then as I zoom in, the parcel in question is highlighted in red. As you can see, the parcel has no frontage on any town road. Um, there is, you know, the adjacent lots have frontage on Gretchen Lane, um, but this property is served only by a private right of way known as Peck Lane. And there's a house on the property and has been for many years. If you, if you proceed towards Chestnut Ridge Road, you can see there's a parcel that contains a portion of Peck Lane as part of this access way here. It comes, so that crosses one lot and then crosses a second lot uh, where there's a house and then into the third one back here where um, our house is located. Peter? Yes. Um, I have no map on my screen. So... It hmm. shows uh, more than a meeting discovered how you can evaluate ways. Interesting. Some kind of ad. <laughs> Yeah, I can see the map. Yep, looks fine to me. I can too. Wow. Well, Rob, can you? Oh, wow. That's interesting. It's a Zoom ad. Yeah. Well, let me stop sharing and resharing, okay? Now, that should have taken it away, so just have the video at this point. Correct. Let me go to share screen again. And now it's back to the GIS on my screen. Yeah, looks good. Okay. okay. So just to repeat, the parcel we're talking about is highlighted in red. 
and Peck Lane, so-called, is a private road that runs from Chestnut Ridge Road across a couple of parcels and in, in to serve where we have a house. So the parcel in question, parcels in question, have no frontage on a public road. Um, in 2006, the estate uh, engaged Chris Leonard to discuss with staff the status of these lots. And as a result of that discussion, a letter was submitted, which I have included in the materials for tonight's meeting, that outlined the legal deed history of the property, which is that there were four lots established in the deeds that end up with the estate of John Shepard. These four lots were set forth on a map, which was recorded in the land records in 2006 in file 25, map 55 which I am hoping is being shown on the screen to everybody. If not, let me try that again. Okay, there we go. So as you can see, there were four lots set forth in the deeds. The house is this front lot here with a paved drive that's Peck Lane. And then there was an empty lot um, to the south and two empty lots to the rear. Four lots, this map was recorded in the land records in 2006. Um, of these four lots, three of them are conforming as to area. The fourth lot, this one here, kind of short and narrow, is only 0.7 acres and the zone requires a full 40,000 square feet. So three of the lots are conforming as to land area, fourth is not. None of the four lots have any frontage on any public road. Um, they're all uh, rear, rear uh, landlocked parcels of land but they all existed prior to the adoption of zoning in Bethel in the 1950s. And so they were simply non-conforming lots. Uh, the letter from Chris Leonard is in your material describing his analysis of those. My, um, as I'll explain a bit, I don't agree entirely with the analysis because of the under uh, non-conforming nature of this slot right here. So why are we here tonight? We're here because of section 7.3 Point C, point three of your zoning regulations. Let me um, call it up on the screen. Okay, so here we are in 7.1, sorry, 7.1 C3. And what this section says is any non-conforming parcel lawfully existing at the time of adoption of these regulations and any amendments thereto may be continued as a non-conforming parcel, provided that such parcel has not, once becoming non-conforming, been in the same ownership as an abutting parcel. Um, I have to zoom out because my video of all of you was covering it. So what that is saying is if you have adjacent parcels of land that are in the same ownership, um, there's an issue that you aren't entitled to continue those, land, those lots as non-conforming parcels. And the last sentence says what happens. If such parcel has been in the same ownership as an abutting parcel, such parcels shall, for zoning purposes, be considered to be merged to create a conforming lot or a more conforming parcel. So for us, we, as you saw on that map that set forth four parcels, they are all non-conforming at the time of the adoption of these regulations, although they were lawfully existing at that time. But because they're in the same ownership, the zoning regulations through this section consider them to be merged into a single parcel. So we've taken four parcels and turned them into one parcel. This is called automatic merger under the zoning regulations. And it occurs even if the uh, property owner has the intent to keep the lot separate, such as by setting them forth on particular deeds, which is what happened here. Now, why am I asking you about this section? I have to rotate. The, the language in this section came into effect in 2010, which is when you did a comprehensive rewrite of your zoning regulations. Before 2010, the language that I'm showing you on the screen, and this is in the materials that I gave you, was in effect. 
And what it says is non-conforming single lots in contiguous ownership upon which no building has been erected shall be required to conform to the standards for density and height and yard requirements and lot size for the applicable zone district as specified herein. Note the lack of the word lot frontage in that section. <clears throat> lot frontage was not one of the things that the regulations before 2010 considered to require this automatic merger. The change in 2010 by broadening the categories of nonconformities brought lot frontage into the equation. Now, I didn't go back and figure out when this section was adopted. It's not really relevant. I can tell you that it was sometime between adoption of zoning and, and the year 2000. Um, these are, this provision is not in the original zoning regulations, for example. It came in at some point. Um, so unfortunately, in 2010, when you adopted your you know, omnibus zoning regulation rewrite, the effect of introducing lot frontage as something that requires automatic lot merger was to drastically reduce the value of this land. Um, at the moment, before those regulations were adopted, there were three lots really. Um, one had the house on it, and then there were two vacant lots. These were building lots. They could be sold as building lots, even though they had no frontage on a public street. Um, and uh, as a result, we had the full value of three lots. The moment those 2010 regulations went into effect, that went away. And now what we have is one parcel of land that is one building lot that can't be divided, um, that has essentially you know, a one acre lot and nine acres of excess land, which on the open market, the value of that is drastically reduced. So what happened was the estate was put underwater on its obligations. There is a mortgage on the property. There are estate expenses that have been paid and have to be repaid. And it's not possible to go and pay off all of those expenses if the value of the land isn't supported by what it was coming into 2010. And that's all as a direct result of this amendment. So essentially, we're here tonight to throw ourselves on your mercy and say, maybe you didn't consider the effect of the 2010 amendment and what it would have on properties throughout the town. And I can tell you that I am working with other property owners that have this exact problem. Now, some of those property owners have a much more minor problem because even though the land is considered merged, they can make a subdivision application to unmerge it. And yes, you're going to exact uh, open space contributions and there's gonna be application fees and we have to hire an engineer on those properties. But at the end of the day, the, the lots will be redivided back out with appropriate frontage. Um, this one, we can't. And that goes back to the GIS I showed you where none of the por no portion of the lot has any frontage. So we can't just submit a subdivision application and say, you know, let us try again, we'll meet the current requirements. Um, I provided to you in your package, a copy of the statutes it's sideways at the moment. Um, but uh, if you can read through the statutes with authorized zoning regulations, at the end of, of sec subsection A, there are a number of provisions that discuss um, how you handle nonconforming uses. So such regulations shall not prohibit the continuance of any nonconforming use building or structure. Such regulations shall not provide for the termination of any nonconforming use solely as a result of non-use, shall not terminate or deem abandoned a non-conforming use building or structure unless there's an intent to do so. That's in the statutes. Um, the case law has held that an automatic merger provision such as you have in your regulations is perfectly fine. Um, and the reason that the case law has held that is they consider that a vacant lot that does not have a building on it is not a use building or structure. Um, so these provisions are not directly applicable. Um, that being said, the towns across the state handled this type of thing in different ways. There's no consistent way of handling it. Some towns have an automatic merger provision like you have. Other towns uh, require a showing of intent for a merger to happen. 
Uh, my personal opinion is that regulations that require intent are better because you are not taking away the value of somebody's property by making these changes. Now, a couple of policy issues. If this type of provision had been in the first zoning regulations adopted in 1955, I don't think anybody would have any complaint about it. What, what we have a problem with is them being sort of tucked into a 2010 omnibus zoning rewrite. How is a property owner supposed to know that you're taking an action that will result in such a significant uh, reduction in the value of the property when it's in that kind of a, a zoning ado adoption? Even if it had been in, done in 2010 as a single you know, standalone text amendment, maybe we wouldn't even know about it then, um, but there's a better chance. Um, second, and, and I think important, if you consider taking this step to revert the change, um, you are not really changing what can be done on this property beyond what was allowed in 2010. None of the lots can be divided because in order to do a division, you have to meet the current zoning regulations and they can't, they have no frontage. So it's not as if there'll be a subdivision out on this land. Um, all we're asking is that you allow the reestablishment of the three lots that were in place in 2010. The other thing that's important is the front, the requirement that we're talking about lot frontage is designed to provide for a couple of things. First is to make sure lots are of a minimum width that we don't have strange, very, very, very narrow lots. And so you allow a certain amount of lot frontage for a lot in the zone. And you allow in some zones rear lots to have 25 feet of, of lot frontage. Um, there are other requirements in your regulation, such as your minimum square, which take care of that problem. So we don't have to worry about lots being overly narrow. Second, it's to provide for access to the property, to make sure that somebody who has a, a home uh, can get from that home to a public street. In this case, we have access over Peck Lane that's established in the land records. So we, we, we are not in a situation where we are creating lots that we then have to go and fight somebody to demand access over their property. The access already exists, Peck Lane, uh, so-called, the right of way already goes uh, through those properties and into the back where these lots already existing uh, have the right to use Peck Lane. Uh, just as an aside, Peck Lane was created in the deeds that that conveyed these lots initially um, as laid out in Chris Leonard's letter. So for all of those reasons, we, we think that our situation is somewhat unique in that we can't fix what you did. I say you, what the 2010 commission did um, by doing a subdivision, we're stuck and there's been a drastic reduction in the value of this property as a result. So as I said, we're here to uh, lay out to you what happened, um, to have you take pity on us and revert the change. Um, I did draft language, which is uh, limits the reversion to just this situation. This is the new language that I'm proposing that says, notwithstanding the provisions of this paragraph, a parcel lawfully existing at the time of adoption of these regulations but which is a non-conforming parcel solely due to non-compliance with any lot frontage requirement of these regulations shall not be subject to the merger requirements of this paragraph, may continue to exist as a separate parcel of land despite common ownership, unless there's an intent to merge such parcels as a matter of legal title. So that's all I have uh, for my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions and discuss any portion of this with you. Thank, Thank you. you, Peter. Right, as this is a public hearing, we'll move out to the public. I believe everyone heard David's instructions. Uh, should you want to make a comment or ask a question? David, are you seeing anyone? I am not, Chairman Rist. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, moving on, Kitty. Okay, Peter. Clarify some things for me here, please. I will do my uh, best. 
So before 2010, there were three lots back here or four? There are four parcels of land. But there, they can't be lots because they're not acreage. Let me call up the map for you. So these are the four parcels of land. They all existed prior to 1955, the adoption of zoning in Bethlehem. Right. But now they have um, to be in that zone to be a lot. It has to be one acre. One acre, 40,000 okay. feet. So, <laughs> so that little number four doesn't really count. Well, let me clarify that. Okay. When, when zoning regulations were adopted, they said, okay, this is a one acre zone. There was no provision at that time that required merger of lots that are in contiguous ownership. So in 1955, we have four parcels of land that are non-conforming <laughs> parcels that can continue as non-conforming parcels regardless of the size. Uh, um, that being said, one of them, this one here, uh -huh. was undersized at the time. It had the non-conformity because there was nothing in the regulations that said you couldn't do that. At some point before 2000, you adopted a provision that said, hang on, any non-conforming lots that are non-conforming as to density, yards, and size, and this is one more, um, that are owned by the same person and are contiguous are considered merged. So whenever that provision was adopted, I don't know when it was, this provision, this lot here is the only one that would have fallen into it. And so, you know, it's probably considered merged in with this one here at that time. So basically we're looking at three lots. Basically we're looking at three lots. And what you're going back to the non-conformity, <laughs> that would mean that you could come in and you could subdivide this property? No, we no. can't subdivide. That's right, but you can sell them as separate lots. We can sell them as separate lots, correct. The reason we can't subdivide is a subdivision <laughs> or a first cut must comply with the current regulations. Right. And there's no frontage. So, uh, you know, right there, we can't divide them. <clears throat> and would yeah. these be considered in essence, rear lots? No, a rear lot is a technical term in your regulations. Right. Right. In certain zones, which the R40 is one, okay. you can have a rear lot that has 25 feet of frontage. Right. And it has twice the land back. area size. Now, I do want to make one other point, which is that in Bethel, frontage is required to be on a public street. Right. Many other towns allow frontage to be on a private street. And right. if that were the case, then you have we, it. You know, we'd, we'd be fine, basically, right. almost, almost fine. <laughs> now, can you also, uh, you, you mentioned, do, can you tell me how, roughly, this text amendment, how many other properties would this involve? I can't could, tell. Could this touch? Roughly. Yeah, I, I can't tell you without looking at every parcel in Bethel. No, because you, I, you mentioned it before that you knew. Yeah, I have another. I have another client that I've been working on. Um, we were we were going to going to come in with a subdivision. Um, we we've now possibly reached a deal to sell a big chunk of it without needing a subdivision. So, All right, so so basically, you know. what you're asking for is just to leave it as non-conforming, so they can sell free lots. What I'm asking you to do is to adjust the regulations. Essentially, back to what it was in 2010, mm -hmm. which will unmerge our lots and allow us to go sell this as three lots and realize the value that's needed to pay off the mortgage and cover the estate's expenses. Thank you. I understand now. Totally. Go ahead. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, Penny. Um, I, I think that Kitty's last question actually answered the one that I was wondering about, um, about merging that little narrow <clears throat> property in with the, with the lot that has the existing house. Yeah, I think uh, that's what, I think that's what happens. Yeah. Um, because all four lots lack frontage, but mm -hmm. this lot in addition is undersized. And so right. that would remain, and we're not asking you to change that rule. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, maybe you should, but I'm not asking you tonight. Uh, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Please, we'll, we'll, we'll wait till next year. Yeah, um, exactly. Right. Or next meeting. Um, so I would say this lot is considered to be merged with the house lot. All right. As, as Another as quick question. 
when the um, when the estate goes to sell the property, do they have to sell the entire property with all three lots, or are they permitted to sell individual lots? Well, that's the whole reason we're here tonight. Is if if you deny this application, then our only choice is to sell the whole property as one single nine point seven acre parcel. Mm -hmm. And what that means for value is essentially you get credit for one lot, one one acre lot. Mm -hmm. And then the rest of the land, 8.7 acres, is just excess land. And it has nowhere near the value of that one acre that's a building lot. <laughs> We're allowed to sell it as three lots, two, you know, three building lots, basically. Um, then we get that you know, three times the base value plus the excess land value. And that's how we support the value that it was before 2010. Okay. Each of these lots has deeded rights to use Peck Lane. So that's there. Right, right. Okay, thank you. That, that was my question. Thanks. Thanks, Penny. Kenny. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with this property. I've been on it many, many times. Uh, family, friends have went to school with them. Um, I don't have a problem with this. I see this as a reasonable solution to their problem and I'm okay with it. Thank you, Kenny. Uh, John. Um, I guess I'm still chewing on it, but, but Peter, I, I don't know if it's fair to say that in 2010, when we wrote, rewrote the regulations, the estate or the homeowner wouldn't have any idea that a non-conforming lot would have been merged together. I mean, we had public hearing after public hearing, and I think even you were on the commission at that point, and we were trying to make non-conforming lots more conforming. And this one was probably certainly on the radar because here's a lot with no road frontage, you know? So I was not on the commission at the time. I was only on the commission until 2007. Otherwise I would take full responsibility for helping draft it. Um, but I don't have any recollection of this, of the, of the um, expansion of this provision being discussed. Now it was 11 years ago and you know, my brain cells are half dead, so could have. But I don't know how uh, you know, an individual property owner is, unless you have a very strong interest in zoning, is expected to read an entire zoning rewrite and figure out that that's gonna have a direct impact on their property. And, and one of the reasons I know that is I know of at least three property owners that had no idea um, that this was, that this was um, in, in place. And, you know, I've talked with other lawyers about it and they had no idea this was in there as well. And it's 11 years later. Um, so I, I'm not saying that's the reason you should grant this. I'm just saying, hey, something happened here that took away a significant portion of this property owner's value and we'd like you to revisit that as to whether it's an appropriate policy. Okay, but, but the spirit of us when we rewrote the regulation was to try to clean up problem lots like this. So, you know, that's not a debate anymore because we, we're here today. But that little parcel behind the house lot, yeah. what, you know, what is the status of that? Has that been combined or the whole thing is combined and it has to be redrawn or we need to backtrack and, and create the lot lines again? So one of the problems with automatic merger provisions, as opposed to provisions that operate based on the intent of the property owner, is that there's a diversion between legal title, you know, what's in the land records and mm -hmm. what the zoning staff thinks the status of the property is. Um, this map was recorded in 2006. Uh, based on the regulations at that time, this lot should probably not have been set forth as a separate lot because the regulations at the time said continuous ownership of undersized lots means they're merged. And so this, this line here probably should not have been there. Um, and, and that's what I believe would be the zoning status of the lot today, that it is merged with this property here. Now, the assessor's card, the assessor's map, as I showed you, the GIS, shows it all as a single parcel. Um, and that, I think, is, is why Chris Leonard's letter in 2006 was generated, is to say, hang on, the assessor's not right that we actually have more than one parcel of land here. And that's why all this was done in 2006. 
Okay, so your text amendment, right? The way your language, what does it do to that lot? It says you could go back to that and that, and that is creating four lots here. Okay. Well, it's not creating four lots. This map shows four lots because that's what they were as of the 1940s. I mean, you can see the volumes and pages here, volume 39, volume 62. Those are very, very old you know, land records books. Um, if this text amendment is passed, we will file another map that will show these two lots here as merged. Um, because that's okay. what I think the regulations I will yeah. establish at that point. Okay, because that one's not gonna fit a building square anyway. Yeah, exactly. It's not, this bit here is non-conforming for many reasons. <laughs> right. The other three lots conform in every other respect except for lacking lot frontage on a public street. Gotcha. I, I just would feel really uncomfortable if 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 we adopted that new text amendment and because you're going back past 2010, it created four and not three. That, that's where I'm going. Definitely. Yeah. I don't think that's the case. OK. OK. That's all I have, Pat. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, Rob Stoll. Peter, you mentioned in passing in your presentation about fu potential future building and something that could not be built there. Can you go, you remember that sure. sentence? Yeah. Can you go back to that again and expand a little bit? So uh, obviously I'm here on behalf of the estate of John Shepard and we're talking about our property. I'm not, I don't wanna talk about other properties at the moment, but um, if this amendment is approved, as, as I've just said, we will end up with three lots. One already has a house on it and, and would be, maybe I should um, call up my drawing tools. Give me one second. I can't get to the box where I can type draw, but. Oh, well, I'm sorry, I can't draw. I'd like to draw, but um, the, the the window of, oh, there we go. Yeah, it's I, on the right. I can do, I can do it now. Um, okay. So this lot here is essentially the house lot. Um, that would be one lot. And then these other two lots, one and two, are vacant lots that can be sold for building purposes. Obviously, they have to go get septic approval, uh, wetlands approval, all the other things that would make something a building lot. Um, but those two lots can be sold as such and, and would have the value of, as such, which is what we're trying to do. Because a subdivision and or a first cut of land um, must comply with current zoning regulations in order for it to be approved, those three parcels can't ever be divided again unless you change your regulations to get rid of frontage as a requirement um, because they have no lot frontage. They're non-conforming, they're separate lots based on my amendment, but they can't comply with the current regulations to provide lot frontage for each of the components. So they can never be divided again. Now that is not necessarily the case with other properties. As I said, the one that I'm working on can be redivided by a subdivision because it has enough frontage to make that work for a certain number of lots. Um, and, and that's not the case here, which is why we're somewhat unique. Did that answer the question, Rob? Uh Partially. Okay, what did I miss? I, I, I guess what I'm, I guess I'll just come out and say it. What I'm, what I'm concerned about is that that uh, back parcel, let's see, very small print. There was five, five and a half or 5.6 acres approximately. 5.6 acres, correct. So cannot be divided. Can't be divided, but a lot can go in there. Well, the zoning regulation, those the zoning regulations allow one house on that lot. 
Okay. Right, because it's an R40 zone um, and it, re, it only allows one house per parcel. So that's, that's the only thing the zoning regulations would allow. I can't speak to whether there are other alternatives to increased development, but if there were, lot frontage would not stand in the way of use of a 10 acre parcel. And we wouldn't be here with you asking you to adjust it so we can, you know, so we can keep these three lots. I got you. <laughs> Thank you. Please leave this picture up front until you finish with the other. Uh, Linda. Linda, are you on mute? I'm sure she's here. I thought I saw her too. She is currently muted. Linda, you're on mute. <laughs> All right, we'll come back to her. Uh, Rob Wallace. So um, I don't have the uh, proposed text amendment in front of me. Is it specific to this R40 zoning or is it more broadly written? It, it applies throughout the, the town. Could it be? Um, sure, you can write it any way you want. Okay. Um, if, you, if, if that's what you think would be needed, you can insert a clause that says in the R40 zone. Uh, I'm not sure that's a rational distinction, but maybe R40 and R80 together might be rational. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was my only question. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, Linda, can you hear us? Okay, I guess not. I, I had no questions. There were great uh, questions that were asked. I, yes, Kitty. Can I come back just a minute, Peter? So this, the way it's written right now, you have it down as four lots, yes? No, it's three. Right. But, well, but the picture here shows four. The, yes, this, this map was recorded in 2006. Chris okay. Leonard in 2006 made, made a detailed argument that there were four lots. Okay, now my question is- I don't agree with Chris. I think there's three. <laughs> okay, because you're, ta you're saying, I don't wanna give him any ideas, but you're saying you're gonna take this little lot and combine it with the lot in front of it. I think that as a zoning matter, it's already merged. And so we would have to record a map in order to sell the property that reflects the reality of the zoning rate, you know, the current zoning. So, so that's definitely there. It's not, for instance, and sorry to be silly, no, not to be silly, but, but of, of the way I'm looking at this, this back lot is huge. Yes. Why, why couldn't that little lot become a bigger lot and, and then it's four? Well, that's the argument Chris Leonard made in 2006. Right, I read that. <laughs> and he said, well, what we'll do is we'll take some land from the other lots and add it to that. and We'll end up with four lots. Because you have such a big lot in the back. Right. 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 So I think what happens with the requirement in the regulations in 2006 um, is as soon as that was adopted at whatever point in the 1970s or 80s, right. then the, the lot was considered merged. This one only because lot frontage wasn't a merger criteria. Okay, so then- the merger criteria was undersized. So, uh, you know, I don't think Chris was right. What he was, what he was trying to say is um, we, we should be able to adjust this to preserve that as not merged. That's the feeling I got when I read it. But yeah. so now you don't see it that way. Now this is this- He was being an advocate. Is one lot. So there are three lots that you're looking at, not four. There are three lots. Okay. Uh, just, just to be clear, again, these are one of the problems with merger provisions. It's not clear which way the merger went. Yeah. Like this, this lot could very well be considered merged into the back lot. Right. And that becomes, you know, 6.3 acres and the, the house lot stands on its own. But the lot, but we're basically what we're talking about is three lots. Three lots. Okay. All right. Then I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. <laughs> no problem. It's a difficult issue. Um, Madam, Madam Chair, I have one. I, I, I have a yes, yeah. question. Yeah. So, Peter, you, you have the map and, and you shrunk it down or you brought it together. What, it, what? How many feet is a driveway to get to that rear lot? And, 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 and you could give me two numbers. You could scare me with the first number from lot one to the back, and then you could do, you could do chestnut to back. 
I don't know the answer because this map doesn't show a scale. I, yeah. I can go look at the GIS. All right, well, just give me some numbers here. I can't read them. From, from the property line from the neighbor to get, I, I assume the driveway is going to go behind that house and go up the property line to get to the back? Yeah, so um, the first chunk of the driveway looks to me to be 370 to 400 feet. Yeah, 410 to get, to get through that first lot. And then the second lot is 320 to get to our property boundary. Okay. Then so, so part the, of, yeah, I, I then got it. it. Proceed so, from there to get to the rear. Right. So part of why in 2010, we did try to clean up non-conforming lots is we don't let cul-de-sacs go on forever. And, and, and I get cul-de-sacs have more than one home at the end of it, but we're, we're, we're just pushing a problem down the road again. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, you know, if you go peck, it's probably 700 feet and then you're throwing another 600 on there. So now we're at 1400 feet for the fire department to get to a rear lot or an ambulance to get to a rear lot because well, there's no road front there. And I, I, I totally buy in to before zoning was, you know, put together in 1955, but we had a couple of shots to try to clean it up and now we're trying to go backwards again. So a, a couple of things. First is maybe the lot's not developable as a result. Maybe the fire department says, no, we won't approve that. Maybe they have to go find a different way into the property. So as you can see, there's very close to Gretchen Lane, right? Maybe they could acquire rights over this driveway to get in on the other side of, of the stream. Maybe that's possible. Um, none of that's possible without this change in the regulation, All right? We, yeah. we, we, and, and, and not for nothing, but this, you know, this goes up a big hill here. <laughs> um, so I don't know where the development potential of this lot comes in. And, and certainly that affects the value of the lot if you have to build a massive driveway that may not get approved. Um, but we have to start from the proposition that it's a legal lot that can be sold as a legal lot. Um, and, Second, I, you know, I understand that the goal of zoning is one of the goals of zoning is to reduce nonconformities. And you refer to that as clean it up. That's, you know, a, a laudable goal. But in this particular case, what we've run into is the destruction of two building lots of value. And unfortunately, that's put us underwater on, on the obligations that have to be paid. And the sale of this property as a single parcel won't realize enough to pay off the obligations of the estate. And that's why we're here, because we don't really have a choice but to ask for your mercy to say, yeah, we understand the goal of zoning is to do this, but in our case, you, you, you essentially took, took value from, from our property by doing it. Um, so those are two competing you know, theories of zoning law, one of which is to preserve value and the other of which is to reduce nonconformities. Um, what, I would, what I would argue is that what is the value of a lot frontage requirement on a public street when perhaps a lot frontage on a private road accomplishes just as much and maybe that private road needs to be improved to serve these and that's Who's something we can deal with. So. Okay, but, but isn't it true, and maybe Beth, this is for you, once, once we do a text amendment to re-qualify these as lots, the town then doesn't have a right to not, give, not allow you to build a qualified building lot. Is that, isn't that right, Beth? I mean, once, once we give it a, a, a building lot, it, it's, it's a building lot, right? The fire department can't stop them then. Well, first of all, I don't consider... I don't consider this in the true sense of the word a building lot. To me, this is, uh, these are lots that are available for sale and someone has to come in and show their build that they're able to be built upon. 
Okay. And, and that's part of, you know, the department reviews. That's where the fire department would come in. You know, there's all the, the things, your grades, driveways can't exceed 12%. Um, there's other various aspects, health, um, the septics and the wells and all that. So say, for example, this land was put up for sale tomorrow. Somebody come in and say, well, I'm going to buy this building lot and I'm going to say it's a raw piece of land. You have to do all the engineering and such associated with it to prove that you can put a structure on it. Okay, great. Okay, good. That makes you feel much better. Can I just speak in, in regards to, go ahead, Peter. I was gonna say there is a stream that runs all the way across the property. So uh, any attempt to develop the lot or a building is gonna to have to get a wetlands permit to cross that stream. You know, unless, they, unless they can find another way to go over Gretchen Lane or go over to Gretchen Lane. The fire department's gonna to have to review the plans and say, we think this is safe and we can fight this fire or you know, you're going to have to make the driveway bigger to make it all work. So I think Beth's answer was correct that, you know, a parcel of land does not become a building lot unless and until all, all permits are issued. Hey, John. Um, but it still has the value of a building lot. Great. In regards to that, let me just state what, uh, a few other little things that I want to um, bring up. Number one is that usually um, this has come into play now because usually when, um, there is a requirement for maps to be filed in the town clerk's office that they have our sign off, the department's sign off and signature. This map does not have it. Uh, this was done after Chris Leonard's letter was submitted. I have a feeling that maybe a previous staff member didn't want to sign it. Um, the because I, I was just very surprised to find this map on file in the land records. Secondly, um, what I would like to do is refer this to um, Chuck Andrus, our land use council, just to, uh, so I can have a discussion with him prior to you closing the public hearing on what are the possible effects uh, overall in town, not just in this particular instance. Good point. I think that's a great idea. That's fabulous. John, there's a giant ravine behind this house. I mean, a really severe ravine. And it's going to be a high hurdle to overcome some of the difficulties that are there. I agree, okay. Ken. And, I and, and dealing with this on an individual basis is one thing. But you have to understand, I have to look at it, how it affects the oh, town overall. Because it's a tax amendment to the regulations, right? Correct. Right. Correct. Exactly. That's what we were talking about. So. Great. And that's all I had to say. Looking forward um, to hearing what Chuck has to say. So we'll continue this public hearing until November 23rd, Beth. Do you think you'll hear from Chuck by then? I certainly will. All right. This yes, has been continued you. to November 23rd. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Peter. You. Uh, next on our agenda is our business meeting of 1026. I'd like to see Rob Wallace for Bob Legnard, uh, Rob Stoll for Rich Tibbetts. Has everyone had time to read the meeting minutes? Yes. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Uh, second. I'm sorry, who seconded? I believe wa Rob Wallace. Thank sure. you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Um, opposed? Abstentions? I have to abstain. <clears throat> Next on our agenda is work session. Could I make a, a, a motion to add um, 64 Worcester Street to our agenda? I'd, I'm sorry, I'd second that motion. Thank you, Kitty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Abstention? Motion carries. So next is our work session, the Upstream Properties 2 LLC, Text Amendment Section.52, Stony Hill Plan Design Overlay District, 4850 Stony Hill Road. And I believe, Beth, uh, a resolution was prepared for this. Uh, you'll find a resolution in the Google Drive. It was my understanding. At the, David, could you bring it up for them? Um, at the last meeting, you requested. Uh, we had made some amendments within that meeting itself, and the applicant had recommended some amendments. And so we did put a motion together for you. 
Uh, is David here? Yeah, here he comes. How's that? No, nope, that's 64 Worcester Street. <laughs> oh, okay. We're looking for the... Um, Oh, entitled shoot. resolution S H. That's the one. Yeah. Got she it. Mood. There it is. Mood. Mood. There it is. Hold on a minute. Let me make sure it's the right one. That's that's it. Did you have a couple iterations done? Yeah, I did. Um, okay. David, could you, you go to the top, please? You can control the screen, Beth. Well, that's why you do it, because you're the controller now. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Let me just look at this. Because it should have a motion. It should have an effective date on it. That's, there it is. Yes, here we go. That's correct. That's it. Motion to approve with the effective date of November 30th. Yeah, but you see your date is wrong? Yeah, 2020. <laughs> I never said I was perfect, John. <laughs> and I did that on purpose for you. I did that. As a catch? Yes, I wanted to see if you still had it. I I had it. it. And I'm going down to the reasons. Also, so you have the date, you have your motion to approve with your effective date, and then your reasons. Do you want this read into the record? Not the whole motion, no. No, not all of it. So, I would so I'd like to make a yep. So I'd like to make a motion to approve with the effective date of November thirtieth, twenty twenty one, um, a text amendment. The title: Stony Hill Planned Design Overlay District, Section Five, uh, Period Twelve, Stony Hill Mixed Use Overlay District. And I'm just going to go to the reasons. Nancy, you have it in a text. The commission finds that the proposed amendment is in conformance with the comprehensive plan of the town of Bethel. More importantly, it is in conformance with the affordability plan, providing the opportunities to create more diversity in housing located within the POCD plan of 2021. No, it was 2020. No, that's not 2020. Excuse me, right. Yeah. Kitty, that's my motion. Second. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, any discussion? Hearing there has to be, those, there has to be a discussion. Yeah, hold on. Must be. There yeah, has to be a discussion. <laughs> I have discussion. Okay, go ahead, Rob. Uh, hold on a second. I get back to my page here. Okay. Um, on the affordable requirements. Which number? I I know the way it was written and the way that the applicant has asked for uh, use of the area median mm -hmm. income but i personally would submit that i would rather see that red state median income thank you ron that was me too <laughs> well that's that's a I, so i pat i think we should have discussion on that and then yeah, i'd be to. willing to, after a discussion to amend my motion i don't have a problem with it that way I, I felt like it was a good give and take, you know, during the whole open public hearing, and I could go either way on that one, Rob. Oh, I I, I agree with Rob. I was uh, I, I seconded it when we, was waiting for discussion because I also agree that we should be going by the state median income. Beth, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you know what that really? I knew comes you were going to do this. A dollar amount. <laughs> Oh, you know, it was just, I just saw it somewhere. Um, at, at, at this moment, no. Do you think do it's 10,000? Do you think it's what? Yeah. I, no, it, it's, they're very close in numbers right now. Yeah, that's what I thought. But then I just hard, it's, 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 it's hard to believe that we're close in numbers, but I did. I thought it was well, like within $7,000 of income. So, Rob, to, you know, to I'm, that. I'm yeah. trying to Google it right now to see if I can pull it up. Can I just ask a question along that discussion? Sure. Um, Rob and I guess John, 
Is the concern that the use of the word area is too vague? No, 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 no. What, okay. what it is for the affordable part of it, okay. the applicant wanted to do it to the local numbers where Rob wants to do it to the state. And okay. it would be it would be a lower rent. It, it would it would wash right. out to a lower rent if you use the state numbers versus Bethel's numbers okay. or local numbers. Or versus what we're, we're in Fairfield County, Penny. So our rents are much higher. But no, no, no. I, I understand okay. all of that. So okay. by using the state. Yeah. yeah. No, no. I no, I understand that. I'm just wondering if the concern I'm just wondering that the word that was used in the document here is area yeah. compared to state or yeah. Bethel. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. So, I mean, it's it's uh -huh. the word area that is no. the concern. Got That's it. No, I understand, I understand all the rest of it. No, but Penny, what they mean by the word area is in income in our area versus an average income for the state of Connecticut. Where there's oh, where, where if you go up north or or out east, you know income levels are lower than Fairfield County. Right. No, I understand. I got it. Okay. So, Rob, are you still looking up something? I well, I found that the the, the, um, the state. Oh. If if what I was looking at was actually a Connecticut. Uh, government website for say for instance a family of three in the state the median income 100% median income is 105,000 I find that that's high. I think that's a little high that's high that yeah. was lower than what I saw uh, and what I find for the Danbury metro area which I would assume in our area is, is 115 for a family of three, 115.8. So, I mean, those numbers kind of jive mm -hmm. with what John was saying. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, well, that was, I mean, you know, that's food for thought. I don't know if any other commissioners have any input, but I mean, based on what we talked about so far, I, I would like for my amendment to be voted on like it is. I don't think I want to amend it unless any other commissioners have some other information that would make me change it. Well, it's, it's still on um, Robin. Um... Okay, so what you wanted, so you, um, John has made a motion. Mm -hmm. The motion has been seconded, correct? Right. So if someone wants to amend the motion. No, no, no. It's my motion. Nobody could amend my motion. I want, they can I want ask to, you. to ask you. Yeah. Go ahead. They can ask you to amend your motion yeah. mm -hmm. to change um, it from the area median income to the state median income. Right. You would respond to that. Right. Right. I'm not exactly sure that's how Robert's Rules of Order works. Oh yes, it is. It's my motion. Yeah. yeah. But I'm I'm making a motion to amend your motion. No, 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 no. The only Rob, I, I I respectfully disagree. The only way you could do it is you could force the chairwoman to have my motion voted on. It could go down, and then somebody else could make a motion. That's why I said that I that after we discussed it, I still think my motion should go the way it is. So then I would ask the chairwoman. To, to push it, to close the discussion and to go to a vote. Uh, John is right. We can't amend John's motion. John has to amend his own motion. Yeah, right. so John can, John can accept direction? a friendly suggestion. Well, right, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, I, and I didn't, I thought it was a good conversation, but I think, you know, that the con it was a great conversation, but I want to stay with my motion. John, would you be kind enough to repeat your motion? No, no, because I didn't read all that language, but but Nancy has it. No. Well, all right, what yeah. you want to change. Is I don't want to change anything. Okay. Well, so you want to stay with the town income? Right. Oh, oh okay. I got it. Yeah. 
David, you want to go back? All right, so Madam Chairman, you have a motion on the table to accept the tax amendment as proposed with an effective date of November 11th. And mm -hmm. your um, member did state their reasons for such. November 30th, 2021. November 30th. So yep. do you want to vote on, I think, yeah, if there's I'd no like other to, discussion? Yeah, I'd like to take a vote on this. Um, I think we can see everyone's hand. If not, then I will have to ask. So by a show of hands, are we accepting John's motion? No. Okay, oh, Madam Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think it's important for them to do a voice vote. Voice vote. Okay, please. that's fine. We can do that. So Nancy can do the call. Yeah. Do you want me? To, do you want me to call off the names? Yes, please. Okay. Kitty Grant. I vote no. What? I I I I like. The okay. Uh, excuse me. Okay, Pat Riss. John. I have to abstain. John Lennon. Aye. Kenny Parsons. Yes. Rob Stoll. No. Penny Kessler. No. Rob Wallace. Rob Wallace. At this point, no. <laughs> Linda Curtis. I don't know where she is. I don't know either. Her name is there and everything, yeah, but I don't know. She must be her. away from her, her computer. I don't know. Okay. Well, as it stands, we have four no's, one abstention, and two eyes, two yeses. So it appears that this motion didn't pass. Has failed. Correct. Can, can we further talk about it? I mean, I really think that it would be much better. <laughs> I'm sorry. I would like to make I would like to make a motion. Hold on. Gotta go find it. I'm in the wrong place. Why does this keep happening to me? Where is there it is. Okay, hold on. On my way there. I would like to make a motion that we approve with an effective date of November 30th, 2021. Um, the Stony Hill planned design overlay district proposed zone text amendment, including the reasons um, in the memo with the change that we gotta go find it. Availability. Um, in H1, the last sentence, change area median income to state median income. Okay. Before I second that, I just want to make sure we address it in both H1 and, the other one too. and in H2 also mm -hmm. at the very Yes, last agreed. Sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, that's fine. So it's H1 and H2. H2. Correct. Okay. Uh, last sentence, area median income to state medium income. Yes. I have to change, Nance. Okay. Uh, Nancy, do you want to take a vote? No, you need a second. Oh, I'm sorry. Second. Thanks, Rob. Who was that? I'm sorry, Rob? Rob Stoll. Oh, so. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, Kitty Grant? Yes. At wrist? I have to abstain. Great. John Lennon? Yes. Ken Parsons? Yes. Rob Stoll? Yes. Penny Kessler? Yes. Rob Wallace? Yes. We'll try Linda Curtis. I, I wasn't seated for this, so. You wish to abstain? Yes. Okay. Motion passed unanimously. Okay. Motion passed. Yeah. Let's All right, Beth, is there anything else you need on this one? No. Okay. Um, moving on. 
Uh, Louisa, is it Yapangi? Unit five and six, recreational soccer, seven Francis Clark Circle. Uh, Beth, because you were so familiar with the guidelines around this, by chance, did you happen to prepare a resolution? No, I was busy doing a lot of other things. Okay, but you no, can do no it off the fly. You can do it off the fly. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I would make a suggestion, and you could just agree with me that you approve the um, special permit for units five and six, located at Seven Francis J. Clark Circle, to be used as an indoor soccer facility, as stated in a business memo presented by. Louisa Yapangu um, in regards to the business and I'll clean it up. Okay. I'd like I'd like to make that motion what Beth just said. Thank you. <laughs> so we have a second. Second. Thank you, Kitty. Okay. Any discussion? Hearing none. All those in favor? Yes. Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstention. Motion carries. Next is We've added 64 Wooster Street, and we have a motion that was prepared by Beth. Has everyone had an opportunity to read it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to make a motion to approve an applica the application for an 830G affordable housing project consisting of nine units located at 64 Wooster Street in the RR10 zone, tax assessors map 21, block 39. Lot 20A. The commission carefully reviewed the application under Section 830G of the Connecticut State Statute, in particular those items pertaining to health, safety, and welfare of the potential residents and those residential areas in the surrounding property. The commission approves the application with the following conditions 1 through 13. In making its decision, the commission recognizes the need for affordable housing in the town of Bethel. And may I have a second, please? Second. second. Uh, I'm sorry, who was first? Was that you, Penny? Maybe. Yes, it was Penny. Okay, thank you. Uh, any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? I have to abstain. Thank you. Motion passes. Moving on. Hmm. Planner's report. Beth. Uh, yeah. Um. Basically what, what I've done is, and it's just very preliminary, but you will find in the drive a folder called affordable housing. Um, what we've done is we've been working on a map um, and, and at your leisure, look at that. I've listed out some of the zoning regs just as a reminder of what you've done over the last couple of years pertaining to affordable housing. And I'll be adding it to it um, going forward, working with the new commission. And it's really just for a starting point for new commission members. Um, and we'll probably talk about it more, maybe a little bit at our next meeting, which will be in person. Yes. Yay. The end of the month. Um, I'm hoping that all the other commission members will, the new commission members will be able to attend. Um, I'd like to get your input, guys. I'm hoping because we really don't have too much to close with. Um, that we can hold it in meeting room D, our little room, and just spread ourselves out accordingly. Because the next meeting that we have will be a public hearing. It'll be held in the GP room yeah. because it's two um, affordable housing apps. And that will also be in person. So going forward, I mean, we are going to be in person. Yeah. I don't know how you all feel about that. If anyone is against doing that, please voice your opinion. Will I be able to read the New York Times online? Yes. If you bring okay. your laptop, nobody will know. Want to bet? <laughs> I won't tell. <laughs> I can set up the screen for you to, to watch it, too. We do have an Apple TV in there. Ooh, I like but I mean, that. I'm hoping, you know, it's like a goodbye and a hello combined together at the end of the month. And I'm just hoping that um, we can all get together and say goodbye and hello. Oh, cool. hello. It's about time. Good to be okay. with people. I can be there. All right. Is that the 23rd, Beth? Yes. Yes. Yep. Thank you. We'll finish up the one hearing we have tonight, <laughs> but we really don't have any other business coming in. 
Um, and if we do, we'll deal with it. Exactly. That's all, all right. I have for you. Thank you, Beth. Uh, any uh, commission comments? Congratulations no. to our new members. Yes. Yes, welcome. Uh, moving out, is there any public input, BJ? No, no, just hello, everybody. <laughs> hey, BJ. We'll see you downtown, BJ, next meeting. <laughs> All right, if there's no nothing else to discuss, if I may have a motion to adjourn. Moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstention? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.